My name is Jennifer Malloy, and I'm a, an, a professor in the academic literacy department. I was filling in for the coordinators, um, so welcome. And I have the privilege of introducing our speaker today, um, Professor Jeffrey Jankowski. And the title of the event is Forming and Retrieving Memories. So he's going to provide a lecture for you today, and then we'll have some time for uh, questions and answers. And uh, before he begins, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about him. He's a professor in the Department of Social Sciences here at Queensboro. He teaches courses in psychology, child development, and human growth and development. He's taught in learning communities and online classes, worked with students completing honors contracts, and taught several writing intensive courses. He's also a visiting faculty member at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and the Children's Hospital at Montefiore in the Bronx. He received his undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Toledo in developmental psychology. After graduation, he completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Albert Einstein studying attention and memory in infants. Presently, he collaborates on research that is designed to further understand infant and toddler cognition, the predictability of early abilities to later ones, the influence of premature birth on cognition, and the cognitive abilities of girls diagnosed with Rett syndrome. The results of his research have appeared in journals such as Child Development, the Journal of Experimental Child Psychology, Developmental Science and Intelligence. He also has contributed chapters appearing in books such as the Wiley Handbook on the Development of Children's Memories. So please help me welcome Dr. Jankowski to speak with you today. Thank you, thank you. And thanks to Susan Madeira for asking me to participate. Can everybody see and can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Everybody here has read the book and has enjoyed it? Yes. Okay. I think the book Picking Cotton is a very good text for illustrating a few things. I think the one thing it illustrates are certainly some problems with human memory and it also illustrates some problems with the legal system in terms of how we interact, how we understand human memory and certainly eyewitness testimony. My focus today is not so much on the legal system and the problems there. I mean, certainly there are a lot of psychologists who study that. There are so social psychologists, and they make that their primary work. I want to focus today, though, on some problems with human memory. And certainly, we may not even think of them as problems, but let's say the abilities and the limitations of human memory. Because the book illustrates it very nicely and certainly helps to give a nice platform so that we can talk about what human memory is and what affects human memory. When you and I think of memories, I think we sometimes think of them as something locked in time. You participate in an event, you remember an important holiday, or you just engage in something you know, that stands out in your life. And we sometimes think they're locked, they're kept, they're perfect every time we go to use them or to access them. And what we know from a lot of research is that memories not only are impacted by new information coming in, they are impacted by memory that's stored. Memories are kind of like something that grow and change over time. And I think sometimes that can be uncomfortable for us to think about. Although I think we understand that we can impact memories positively, sometimes we're really unsure of how our memories change. And I think certainly we get an inkling of that and an understanding from that from the book. The first thing, certainly we can say flat out, contrary to what we used to think, they're not video recordings. Video recordings pretty much, as long as they're not VCR tapes, will stay fairly intact over time. They may degrade a little bit, but we'll keep them, we'll have them. The novel depicts very nicely the problems that Jennifer had with memory. And certainly, 
it's interesting in the novel we see that she thinks she's understanding and keeping the memory forever. You know, if you think back to the novel, think about what she's going through. In the middle of the attack, in the middle of that horrific situation, notice what she says to herself. She has the wherewithal to say, I need to remember this. Now look, I don't know how you or I would do in such a situation. But certainly she's saying that to herself. And notice too what she says in a little while, that she's having a difficult time actually remembering. Her assailant is looking another direction. She can't get a good view of him. And so certainly we see right there, she's having some problems in this entire situation. And that's something we need to point out early on, because the point I'm going to make is that the way you and I remember things is determined in large part by how we get the information in. And so you see, she's in a horrific situation. She can't get a good view. Not only that, she is probably stressed to the max, and there's fear you know, running through her. All of those things are combining to make for an unfavorable learning situation so that she can remember. What we see presented in the book is not something unusual. Many times eyewitness testimony is wrong. It's been wrong, we've documented it through the years in different research. I think when you and I think of an eyewitness, we may think, aha, that's rock solid. Far from it. In fact, we know it's prone to error, it's prone to problems. And certainly, I think the other idea is that it kind of changes our whole notion of what memory is. In fact, when people say that eyewitness testimony can be wrong, it really changes what we understand about our memory and ourselves. And so certainly, the book, in nice focus, puts that point into, you know, certainly emphasizes that. In fact, even it's interesting, at the end of the text, when she finds out that Ronald Cotton was not her assailant, that she was wrong, you can see how it bothers her how all of a sudden it seems like the whole situation is flipped and now she realizes the wrong person has been accused. And so certainly we're not going to put too much pressure on Jennifer and certainly Ronald takes it very well, saintly frank frankly, but nonetheless illustrating the problems involved. One point I want to emphasize to you and I'm talking now about all the research that we've collected we know that when we form memories, it's a process, okay? In fact, I want to give you another way to think about forming memories. Think about it as we do, the way you take in information. Memories are information that you take in, and it just so happens that some of that information you and I may keep for a long time. And if you think of it as information, I think it changes our whole notion because it almost becomes like water. It becomes very fluid. It's running through the system. And some of that information we keep and some of it we don't. In fact, most of the information that we're presented with we don't keep and much of it we change. Now I want to tell you about three processes. <coughs> When you and I go about the business of taking in information, we also not only take it in, we attempt to store it, and we attempt to retrieve it. Now, I think sometimes we may not have the notion that these processes are involved. Frankly, we don't think about them. But when psychologists look at human memory, these are indeed the three processes that we look at. Take a look at the first one, encoding. Getting information into our memory bank, if you will, is a process of changing it, of transforming it. Think about for a minute when you and I look at someone. You and I may think we're taking in a picture of the person, right? And certainly when you and I look, we know that light energy, it reaches our eyeball, and the light falls to the back of our eye. But what happens at the back of the eye? The information's changed. It's changed into a format without getting into lots of detail in a way that could be sent on to the brain. Then we store the information. Now look, when you and I say storage, sometimes we think, aha, it's there forever. Far from it. In fact, in a minute, I'm going to talk about 
three different types of memory that you and I have. And these three different types of memory are very are important, and I'm going to point out one that's in particular, and one we can illustrate where perhaps Jennifer was having problems. Retrieval, using the memory, finding the memory, bringing the memory back. And certainly this is another important step. In fact, you know, we know today how important retrieval is. We know that human memories are very organized, highly interconnected. They're organized based on meaning and categories. And we know too that even though you perhaps remember something, you may not be able to attach a name to it or a face to it. And sometimes we even say memories kind of get degraded over time. And so that makes them difficult to retrieve. Have you ever had the experience that somebody asks you for the name of someone and you can't remember the person's name? And then after you get up, the first thing you remember as you're eating your breakfast? That was Mary Smith. And that is a classic example of what we say a retrieval failure. You got it into memory, it's there, but when you needed to bring it back, it wasn't. In fact, the work picking cotton showed you very nicely some retrieval problems. In fact, do you remember when Jennifer was in the interrogation room and they were asking her about the whole incident and they were asking her about her assailant? And do you remember how they kept giving her a little bit more cues and clues? And do you remember how she said it was difficult to remember detail and she tried to forget? But as much as she tried to forget, she needed to remember and she was having difficulty doing so. People would look at that and say, that's a classic retrieval problem. She can't bring the information back. That's another issue. I want to talk now, we talked about encoding, storage, and retrieval. Let's step back for a minute and let's focus now on storage because this is where a lot of the problems in human memory are centered. Now when you think about this, here's how I want you to think about memory and storage. This is the first half of the process, getting the information in getting it in into a way that you and I can preserve most of what we've seen. In Jennifer's case, the encoding and the storage took place when the actual incident was happening. That was the first instance where she had to get the information in. She had to get a picture of her assailant. She had to make sure that she saw the person. Now, the first memory store there is sensory memory. Now, when you and I look out at the visual world, as I'm looking out at the, at the people in this room, or you and I are standing on a street corner, our eyes pick up a lot of different information. Our eyes are going across the scene. And for just a split second in time, you and I remember everything. You and I store everything. But here's the problem. We know with sensory memory, it doesn't last long at most about five seconds. In fact, when you look for visual information, what we pick up with our eyes, you're really only talking about a second. So it's a very brief moment in time that you hold everything that you've seen. Now, if you're talking about auditory information, things that you and I hear, well, now you're talking about five seconds. So that's a bit longer. But nonetheless, it's a short time frame. The beautiful thing about sensory memory, everything that is stored there is kept as an exact duplicate, it's kept as a replica, nothing's changed. So that's the good part. We refer to this as snapshot memory because we say it's iconic and an icon you know is a picture, almost like a nice snapshot, a beautiful duplicate, nothing's changed. Or we refer to it, if you're talking about something you and I hear, as a coic. An exact duplicate is when you walk in a cave or a room and you, you know, say something out loud and the sounds bounce back at you exact and entire. 
So that's the nice thing. This is sensory memory. Nothing's changed. But now I want you to imagine that sensory memory has a long hand, or it's at the top here. And the next memory store that we're going to talk about, working memory, is a little bit below sensory memory. Working memory now can reach up into sensory memory and pick out something that it wants to concentrate on. Okay? Now here's the one that we focus on a lot today. When Jennifer was having problems remembering her assailant, when she was having problems remembering her attacker, it was short-term memory that was impacted. Now short-term memory, as we understand it, is where most of the work happens. This is where we store the information, we work with it, and we begin to process it so that hopefully we're going to remember it for a long time. But notice something. It only holds something for 15 to 25 seconds. It's not forever. Here's a crucial statement. It's, it stores information according to meaning. Now that word meaning is a loaded statement because what that word meaning tells us, it begins to attach previous experience, previous information, things you've done in your life, things you've th seen, things you've heard, and it puts it into a context and it combines it with the new information. Now that's an important idea because you may remember in the text, Jennifer talks about how she was trying almost to recognize the person trying to identify, and she had a difficult time doing so. And so meaning is very important, very important. But here's the other catch. Not only does it remember information in a very short way, in a very short time span, it only holds a limited amount of information seven plus or minus two items, and we know that, that's pretty rock solid. Without getting into too much detail, we know people are very adaptable creatures, and we can expand the size of those items, but nonetheless, the size is fixed. Now, how important is working memory to remembering something? Crucial, and I wanna give you an example. I ran across this a few years ago. I work with kids a lot and we were working with 11, 12, and 13-year-old kids. We were testing their memory. We wanted to see how they were doing, and we were looking at other things. But it was interesting. We were sitting with a child, testing the kid. He was 11 years old. And we were showing the child pictures, just in a sequence, okay? 12 pictures. And the task was, here, child, remember each of these pictures, because in a minute, we're going to show you the same pictures over again, but now this time we're going to show you one picture with a new one. The child's task was to say which one they had seen before. Seems simple enough, right? What was amazing is when we actually sat with a couple of kids to do this. I'll never forget, I was sitting with one boy, he's at the computer doing the task, the pictures are being presented. And what we were showing the kids were simple line drawings. They were just, you know, kind of, um, maybe one looked like nothing identifiable, it looked kind of like a square with a line going through it. Another one looked like a jagged line. And this kid was going through naming all of them. And he was going through giving them names. I remember that he would say, bowling ball. Oh, that one looks like a lightning bolt. Oh, that one looks, and all of a sudden, he's putting tags on this, okay? But now, Contrast this. Here's a child sitting in a room. It's quiet, no distractions. Kid isn't being attacked or anything. And you can see how much effort this kid is putting forth. Contrast that with what Jennifer is going through. She's in a completely different situation. She's tense, fearful. You know, certainly her blood pressure is through the roof. And now she's trying to remember what seems to be very simple, a face that she doesn't have a clear indication of. Now let's come back to the 11 year old. We show them this series, nice quiet room, air conditioned, no problem. And when he's now presented with the new one and the old one, even though he studied them, I will tell you he only got about 
eight out of the 12 correct. And it was interesting, he labeled all of them. Even when he came back to identify what he had seen, he'd make a mistake. I won't tell you what he said a few times, but nonetheless, he was still making mistakes. And so that tells you how important working memory is. We never gave the child any instruction to give them verbal labels, names, and he did anyways. But this is what matters for short-term memory, for working memory. You work with the information. You get it into a form that you can hopefully remember it for a long period of time. And if you're successful, if the way you worked with the information is great, if the way you worked with it has been sufficient, maybe you'll even push it into long-term memory. Long-term memory is kind of the end game. Long-term memory is that permanent vault that you and I have. And as way we the way we understand it so far, you can store almost an unlimited number of things in there, and you and I have all different types of memories. Very briefly, we have procedural memories, memories for how to do things, opening a door, riding a bike, swimming, writing with a pencil. We refer to these as implicit memories, memories that don't require much conscious awareness. You know, certainly you and I can eat lunch very comfortably, use the uh, spoon, the fork, the knife, and carry a really important conversation, okay? Don't have to give much thought to bringing back to awareness how it is that we eat with a fork and a knife. But here's the one that Jennifer now is confronted with. She has formed a declarative memory. Now declarative memories have an interesting aspect that when you bring them back, we say they require a lot of awareness, a lot of attention. We say they're explicit, you speak them, okay? Think back to when Jennifer's trying to remember. She's in the court, and she's even before that talking with the detectives. She's giving a lot of effort to bringing the information back, and she's telling you in the novel she's having a difficult time doing so. Now, you might be tempted to say, or I might be tempted to say, the problem is in retrieval. She can't bring the information back. That it's there, but she's having difficulty remembering it. What psychologists would say who study memory, it probably isn't a problem with long-term memory. It was a problem that it was really never put into working memory well so that it could be pushed down into long-term memory. In effect, what she's dealing with, remember the idea of information, she's dealing with incomplete information. She's trying to pull out something that really isn't there, okay? And it's interesting, in the novel, you notice that when she's having difficulty doing so, detectives, attorneys, are eager to help her out, right? And they give her clues. Well, here's one thing we know about human memory. Humans are very good at taking the information. And what do we do? We build a story around the new information. We're gonna come back to that point. But her difficulty at remembering was not so much probably that the information uh, was there, it probably was not there. That's what we put our money on. I want to talk now about some things that we know that really impact memory, what make it better for you and I to store information, and I think this begins to give us an understanding of why it is that Jennifer could have had problems. One thing we know, when we talk about getting information into long term, remember we said meaning is so important. Attach meaning to it. Make it relevant. Take some information from your brain. Attach it to the information coming in. That's when you'll remember it well. Well, you know, the classic way of talking about this have you ever gone to the grocery store with a list of items to get? And you know, certainly you maybe have your phone, you maybe don't. Or if you're like me, you don't want to use your phone or a piece of paper, what do we say? Oh, I'll remember it. Five items, it seems so simple. Milk, sugar, beans, whatever it is. And all of a sudden you get to the store and guess who you see? A long lost friend from 30 years, or in my case, or maybe a year ago. You start talking. And all of a sudden, when you start talking, where does the information go? 
out. And then you end up calling home to find out what you needed to buy. Simple rehearsal. Now think about this. Jennifer really is in a situation almost like this. She hasn't been prepared for study. She doesn't know the person. This came as a complete surprise. And here she is trying to get information in about the attacker's face. If you really want to get information in, now you bind it. You put it together with things in mind. The list of items to the grocery store, imagine yourself making a cake. Imagine yourself making breakfast. See the different pieces. That is what will get the information to come in. And this is always a classic demonstration here. Simple rehearsal versus elaborative. Getting information in deeply, intertwining it with information you have, will always make it easier to remember. In fact, have you ever noticed what you've been taught in class? How many times you learn, we tell students, make sure that you make the information relevant to yourself. Attach meaning to it. See it in terms of your career. See it in terms of your education. Those are important words. Because what that tells us is, you're going to remember the information for a long period of time, more than likely. Are there any questions so far? Um, is another rehearsal also maintenance rehearsal? There is maintenance rehearsal. There's a number of different types of rehearsals we could go into. But just the idea that the way that you certainly maintain it, the way that you keep it there, is going to make a big impact on how you are able to remember it. Okay? But certainly, yes, there is maintenance rehearsal too. And that brings that point brings us nicely to the following. The way you process, the way you work with it, it's going to make a big difference on retrieval. Now, it seems all well and good, doesn't it? Seems like if you are there remembering. But remember, memory is this part of the human experience that's impacted by a number of factors. Now, think about what Jennifer is going through. She's trying to remember her attacker. I'll tell you another important part of the whole memory process of getting information in is attention. In fact, today we understand attention to be extremely important for remembering things. Not simply that you give something your full and undivided attention, that you really focus on it, but also, too, that you actually look at things in a very nice, even way. Now think about what Jennifer is going through. It's dark. She can't see well. She's not getting a good view. And all of that is impacting how well she's able to scan, as we say, or look at the information. Attention tends to be a very critical component, one that if you're not attending, you're not looking, you're not going to get the information into long-term memory. How about speed? Speed, we know, differs amongst people. You look at young kids, they tend to be a little bit faster than older individuals. Imagine if you can funnel more information in. You can keep packing it in so that it's sent down the pipeline. If your speed is slower, the whole system slows down. And the point I'm making here is certainly memory seems like this beautiful, isolated ability. But we know now it's tangled with these other issues. It's tangled with attention and it's tangled with speed. Now, Jennifer has a problem remembering. Let's take a look at two things that really are also impacting the ability for her to bring information back. We talk about something called executive attention, okay? It's an interesting idea. Let me describe it for a minute. You know, when you and I are trying to attend to something, we say we're trying to focus on it. True. Now think of what it means to focus. If you are really trying to pick up the information from your text, something you're reading in class, your professor tells you you have a test tomorrow, 
You need to study these first five pages intensively. Think of what you're doing. We say, well, yeah, you have to look at the text. There's two other things, though, that are crucial. You have to make sure that your eyes are going across the text and you're picking up all of the information. You don't just focus on one area. If on your text you have a figure at one point and maybe a diagram at the other, you have to look all the way through, okay? Here's another important component. When you're studying, is it good or bad to have a cell phone out? Well, you know what I would say. It's very bad to have it out. Think about what happens. When the cell phone is out, our attention keeps getting pulled over to the phone. You're getting more distracted by the information. Now, poor Jennifer, she is in this extremely stressful situation. She has difficulty focusing. We know her thoughts are more rational. And not only that, she needs to study her attacker's face. Can she do that? Of course not. She's being distracted in a number of different ways. And she's unable to block out those distractions. She's unable to she's inhibit or stop that from happening. And as such, she's having difficulty processing the information. And we know from a lot of studies that certainly a person's ability to bring back information is impaired. Think about something else we know. When people feel threatened, did you ever notice how our body changes? Somebody says something to you, and perhaps they insult you, and all of a sudden we say our hair stands up on the back of our head, our blood pressure rises, we want to take action. Well, we also know too that at that very moment, a chemical called cortisol from the adrenal gland is flooded in the body. What does the cortisol do? It initiates something called our stress response, flight or fight. We also know too that when you're stressed out like that and cortisol is flooding through your body, it negatively impacts, it makes it difficult to remember because it blocks some centers in the brain from remembering the information. So Jennifer has one strike against her memory, amongst others, and that's stress. Stress is not a good factor. Stress is gonna make it difficult for her to remember, okay? How about fear? You and I in such a situation were probably afraid for our lives. She even said she didn't know if she was gonna make it out of there alive. In fact, we know another woman who was attacked, she was killed, right? And certainly I think anybody would think that you don't know exactly what's going to happen. Fear does nasty things to the quality of our memories, okay? Our memory becomes fragmentary, broken up. There's an interesting point in the book. Did you notice what she said when she was in the whole situation and even when she was trying to remember, she talks about time and how time seems to be this unusual component and that it seems to be almost in a different quantity, a different way. It doesn't seem to be what we typically experience. Well, that's in fact what people typically report with stress, that the timeline of our memories is messed up. Okay. Once again, notice your ability to bring back some information, to recall it, like if somebody asks you, what'd you do yesterday? Or for Jennifer, tell us the series of events. That is, uh, that's fragmentary, it's messed up. It's also interesting too, there's an area in the brain, actually very near another very important area called the amygdala. Now the amygdala is important, why? When people feel fearful, it becomes very active. Now that's good, because it initiates a series of responses that hopefully will keep us alive. Here's the downside. It kind of shuts off those areas that we need to remember something well. And in fact, we know that when your amygdala becomes active, an area of the brain known as the hippocampus, which is important for memory, kind of shut down. And also, remember I talked about attention and how important that is? That area of the brain, the cortex, the frontal cortex, that's wiped out also. It has difficulty remembering. In fact, there's a very interesting phenomenon called superencoding, and it deals with people who have experienced something traumatic. They remember in great detail what happened before or after, 
or they remember a specific thing from the event, like it's common for a person who experienced a traumatic uh, event, like a robbery or a rape or whatever, they don't see the person well, they don't see the room well, but what do they remember? The gun. And they remember that in vivid detail. Why? If you're very fearful, and the part of your brain that really takes care of attention and modulates it is shut off, you're going to hyper-focus, focus intensely on something about one aspect of the event. And that's why a lot of times when people are asked about, tell us about the room in which you were attacked, they can't do it. They only remember maybe one or two things. And the attorneys are asking, well, you know, this was something that was very important to you, something that was awful, you need to tell us more. And those memories are gone. That's not uncommon. In fact, you'll notice the context is gone. And you know, if I asked you, for instance, after you left this room, you're walking out of the hallway, tell me about the bricks of the walls, or tell me about the PowerPoint, tell me what the podium looked like, tell me how I was dressed, tell me what the ceiling looked like, you'd probably be pretty good at doing it. But if the context was different, and it was very fearful, if we had induced fear in you, a lot of these, a lot of the context would be lost and forgotten. And this is where many times, unfortunately, people can get mistaken and other people begin to tell them things and they fill it in. And certainly, once again, the sequence of information is lost. Isn't that interesting, Jennifer, saying the timeline is all messed up. She can't recall when exactly things occurred. She's getting mixed up. Not uncommon. Now, as I begin to wrap things up, I want to make a couple points. And the points are focused on kind of characterizing what memory is like. And also, let's focus a little bit on what the law and what psychologists see as important when using eyewitness testimony in the courtroom. I want you to keep in mind that when you and I retrieve something from memory, when we bring it back. We do not have the idea any longer that we're going into a vault, pulling something out, looking at it, using it, and putting it back in the exact same format. We're not. In fact, when you pull a memory out and you say, ah, oh, there it is, if somebody around you comes and starts talking about this thing, making comments about it, says, oh, I don't remember the party this way. I remember this is the way the party happened. Don't you remember what you did? there's a high likelihood you're going to take the information, make it part of this memory, repackage it, and not even know that that's not what you experienced, it's what your friend experienced. But we put it back and we say, oh yeah, I was wearing that purple shirt. Oh yes, I was singing that song, even if you never did it. There's a high likelihood you'll incorporate it and you'll remember it, okay? In fact, I'll give you, an, I'll give you a nice example. We know in babies, for instance, their memories, in terms of what they can recall, children, only begin about three years of age, okay? And if you ask a person, for instance, hey, how did you like your first year birthday? What did you do? Most people would say, I don't know, I don't remember. That's the right response. A number of years ago, I was talking to a parent, and the parent said to me that they had a very clear indication of what they did on their seven-month birthday. And I said, well, you know, we really don't think that can happen. I mean, the brain isn't developed enough. We don't have language yet. And there's a whole other thing, list of things that aren't in place. And the parents said to me, no, I remember. I didn't argue. But nonetheless, probably what happened is mom or dad are talking about something this kid had done at seven months that now the, is the adult. They've said it a number of times. The person internalized the information. And that information seems so much like their own they can't distinguish it from someone else. So the idea is memories are reconstructed. They're built every time you and I use them. They're not stagnant in time. Now, I want to tell you about some things that we talk about in psychology of how to maintain the integrity of memories, particularly as it comes to eyewitness testimony, that you saw somebody do something. And here's a description. And the key here is, this is what you put in place to try to keep the information pure, pristine. 
it's not a guarantee, but certainly you can do this. And certainly, think about this too in terms of the novel. Were these guidelines put in place or not? And I'll tell you, these guidelines grew out in a number of areas, not only in regard to adult eyewitnesses, but also grew out in terms of what, were ha what was happening to children. You know, a number of years ago, probably about 30 years ago now, there were cases brought against daycare providers who were supposedly abusing the children in their care. And these kids were weaving fabulous stories of abuse, awful stories, but nonetheless, very extravagant stories. And even in New Jersey, just over the line, there, was, there were daycare providers who were almost put in jail for 15 years based upon the testimony of kids. And when you saw what the attorneys were asking of their children, a few psychologists jumped in. They provided some briefs to the court and said, let, let us make you aware of some memory research. And the people were, all the charges against them were dismissed. Take a look at this one. You interview the eyewitness as soon as possible after the alleged offenses by interviewers who provide as little information as possible. Two reasons why. You want to get the information as close as possible to when the event occurred because you don't want anybody to mess up the information. You don't want them to tamper with it. You don't want them to give their opinion. You don't want them to tell the other person what they should think. You want a story that is their own as much as possible. Okay? Now look, is information and memory going to play a role? Of course. But at least maybe you won't have other people asking or uh, contributing information. Let's build on this point. So how do you ask questions of people who are eyewitnesses? You don't say, for instance, so tell me, why do you think Ronald Cotton raped you? Okay. Now, it may sound crazy, but not so many years ago, that was done in courts. The suggestion now is you don't do that. You simply ask, tell me what happened. Now, you'll notice it really puts the burden on the person who has made the claim, right? And so certainly now, you're not going to try to bias their uh, opinion one way or the other, or what they say has actually happened. And that's a very important point, open-ended questions not leading questions. Encourage the eyewitnesses to talk about only what happened. This is an interesting point. You know, sometimes eyewitnesses would be asked to talk about things they thought should occur. Or, what do you think would have happened in this situation? Would the person have raped you in this situation? Types of those, those types of questions are not encouraged. You only ask the person to talk about what really happened. Once again, it's no guarantee, but at least you're not encouraging people to make giant leaps in what they think actually happened. This is an interesting point. Many times in courts, years ago, they would give people recognition types of questions. Now, a recall question is when you ask a nice, open-ended question. No suggestion. That's good. You don't want to say something like, well, how awful did the event make you feel? Why? And then all of a sudden, you're prompting the person, but you're asking them for a particular response to a question. When you begin to do that, there's a much higher likelihood that the person is going to respond in the way that you may like them to. For instance, I will tell you when such measures have been used with children, if you ask a child a question long enough, you will get the answer that you want. You can ask the child, was this the person that raped you? Was this the person that touched your genitals? And they may say, no, 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 but the persistence pays off because eventually the interrogator will get the question that she or he wants, yes. And all of a sudden, that's taken as evidence. That is not permissible in many courts today. And actually, that's what got the court case thrown out in New Jersey. One last point. Does anyone know today what a lot of uh, people in law will say about eyewitness testimony? Should it be kept or thrown out? Well, actually, people will say you should keep it only if you have good circumstantial evidence and DNA evidence. 
okay? On its own, like what happened to Ronald Cotton, based upon the, the uh, opinion of one person, you could not do that today in many courts. You have to have evidence that corroborates, that goes along with that. And if you don't, it'll be dismissed. Any questions? I have a question on the okay. um, I study sometimes. Like, I don't, I can't, like, I haven't focused on this part of my studying, but I mm -hmm. can focus a lot on this. But right before I go to bed, I might just, like, skim through what I read. Mm -hmm. Like, what I, uh, what I didn't study for that much. Mm -hmm. But just so I could say, oh, okay, I read a little bit, so I probably remember it tomorrow. But when I wake up, I remember it really good. How well, is that? Like, on every exam, I always remember it really good. Well, that's not uncommon because what we know that there are two kinds of effects. We call them a primacy or a recency effect. And we know that when people are given information to remember, they tend to remember either information well from the beginning of the list or the end of the list. And so given that you're studying the information right before bed, there's no other information that's going to mess up the information you've taken in, you remember it. Not only that, we know when you sleep on information, there's an important process co called consolidation. The brain changes the information, kind of puts it in a form that you're more likely to remember it. Okay? That's why we know if you don't sleep well the night before an exam, you're probably, and you've studied all your studying the night before, you're not going to do as well as if you had slept well. Sorry, I'm going to ask if people have questions if they use the microphone. Sorry. <laughs> so, like, you would say Jennifer's long-term memory got, like, distorted due to stress and fear? That's a good question. I wouldn't even say that her long-term memory was distorted. I would even say that her working memory was distorted. What she was taking in was probably not sufficient. And probably that was a result of stress, fear, and poor attention. So I'm not even sure the information got into long term. I would bet it never made it well into working memory or short term. Remember, short term memory is where we think it's at. That's the important memory store. That's the one that most people study. Um, what about dreams? How come we can't remember them? That's a good question. Well, think about something, the types of dreams that you and I do remember. Typically, people report the dreams they remember are those that are bizarre, unusual. One of the reasons we think why people don't remember dreams well is because most of our dreams are very boring, frankly. <laughs> a lot of the dreams that we have are just about things that were going on through the day, and there's been a lot of dream research and sleep research, and they wake people up after every time they have a dream, and most of the time, all they're dreaming about is the math exam. The exam in English, psychology, the boss at work, and they're trying to get through information that they haven't actually had time to process the day before. That's why we don't remember well. Any other questions? Latent cotton, like, like say if you have a dream or if you're thinking of something, do you believe in like the latency behind it? It's a good question. I assume what you're referring to here is Freud's idea that there's the manifest content to a dream, which is the actual dream, and the latent content or the symbolic nature. I think dreams do have some underlying meaning. For instance, I will tell you, we know around the time of adolescence, a lot of people have a very common dream, and that's the dream of falling, right? Many times people will say, oh, I hate that dream. And you know, you're falling off a cliff, on the you know, 130th night of the year, and before you hit the rocks, you pop out of bed and you're in a cold sweat. We would probably say, look, that dream symbolizes something, probably some fear or a lack of control in your life, okay? And you can see around the time of adolescence, a lot of decisions to be made, and so certainly people may feel a little bit out of control. What most of us would say, though, in psychology today, we wouldn't say it's actually a result of the subconscious or unconscious motives. We would say, look, it just means something is going on, a person's trying to deal with it day after day, and it's being reflected in their dream. We disagree, perhaps, with Freud's interpretation. Let me just mention, if anybody would like a copy of the talk, I printed out some handouts. You're free to take one. 
and thank you for your time.